Good evening, everybody. Um, tonight, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that I join you from today. For me, it's the Gadigal and Bidjigal people of the Eora Nation. Um, and I would love for you to extend this acknowledgement of country by sharing the lands that you join us from today. There is no place in Australia, water, land or air, that has not been known, nurtured and loved by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. This was and always was Aboriginal land. Today, we're starting the Connecting Communities Through Citizen Science conference series that's going to take place throughout June. And it takes place um, at the end of National Reconciliation Week. And many of you will be aware of this. This year, the 2021 theme is more than a word, which urges us to take and more impactful action as part of National Silly Beyond. Um, I'm Associate Professor Alice Motion, and it's my pleasure to host this evening's event and to be joined by two colleagues this evening. We're going to be talking census and citizen science. And this is our first event um, of a conference that's really trying to connect the different ways that communities work in citizen science. Um, we are thrilled this evening um, to be presenting this um, on behalf of the Australian Citizen Science Association. Many of you will have heard about this talk through AXA. Um, if you haven't heard about it through AXA, I urge you to, to go and have a look at our website and to consider joining AXA uh, to find out more about what's going on. And we'd also like to really thank um, the Office of the Chief Scientist and Engineer for their sponsorship of this session and the sessions throughout June. So thank you so much for joining us. Today, we're going to hear from two fantastic people. Um, actually, both of the people who are joining us this evening are colleagues from the University of Sydney. Um, I work in the School of Chemistry at the University of Sydney, um, and I am the host representative for AXA at the University of Sydney and part of the um, Citizen Science Node as co-chair at the Charles Perkins Centre. And two of the colleagues who join us this evening, our Professor Benjamin Eggleton, who is the Director of the University of Sydney Nano Institute, co-director of the New South Wales Smart Sensing Network, and also Dr. Yela Golumbic, who's a postdoctoral research associate in the Scope Group, which is my research team at, at the University of Sydney. Um, and it's really uh, special to hear from both um, Professor Eggleton and Dr. Columbic this evening, because we've got two very complementary um, and contrasting perspectives on sensors and sensor technology. As you'll hear from Ben, who's going to start us off in just a moment when I've given him a little bit of an introduction, Ben is going to talk more about um, the science and the possibilities of science using sensors and comes from the background of a, a physicist and a leader in this field. And Yela is a leader in, the, in, a, in a different field, which is in citizen science and the engagement of citizen science projects. So I hope that you'll enjoy hearing from both of them this evening. The way we're going to, to run today is to have a short talk from, from Ben and then a short talk from Yela, and then we'll have a, a panel discussion that I'll chair, and then we'll open up uh, the discussion to questions from all of you who join us. So please do store up those questions, feel free to ask them in the chat, um, but also feel free to, to raise your hand towards the end of today's session. So I will stop sharing now and I will allow Ben the opportunity to share his slides while I give Ben a brief introduction. Um, he, you will have probably uh, read about uh, Ben's work on the advertisement for this evening, but uh, Professor Benjamin Eggleton um, is the director of the University of Sydney Nano Institute, and he is the co-director of the New South Wales Smart Sensing Network. And as you can see from this slide here, he's also the editor in chief of a really prestigious journal. Um, ben has had an absolute sterling academic career and as a leader in the university and beyond. And the, the, his knowledge of sensors and sensor technology expands beyond his own lab into collaborations and, uh, and other forms of work with people internationally as well as across Australia. 
I don't want to take up too much time from Ben's uh, opportunity to speak. So I will pass over to you, Ben. Uh, we're delighted to hear from you. Uh, please take it away. Your slide is sharing well, um, and we're very happy to hear from you. You are still muted though, Ben. So if you could just unmute, yes, sorry. that would be fabulous. How many times has that happened? Um, I was just saying, what a wonderful introduction. Um, it's wonderful to be here with this crowd. And I'm really honored that I'm having the opportunity to speak to you about uh, smart sensors. So as Alice has said, I have a number of different uh, leadership roles and hats on. Um, this is a photo taken in front of the City Nanoscience Hub with uh, the leadership team, including Alice, who is sitting on our executive as a deputy director for City Nano. I'm very proud of this group of colleagues. Uh, what I'll do in the next 15 minutes, I think, uh, is give you a bit of a snapshot um, on smart sensors in terms of how they are being utilized in the real world to address some of the really important challenges that um, we face uh, on this planet. So. Let's uh, start off right at the beginning. Well, what is a smart sensor? So obviously a sensor um, detects changes in energy of a physical phenomenon and converts them to digital data. So what does that mean? Well, we're all familiar with sensors. So we're surrounded by sensors and I'm gonna give you numerous examples. But sensors detect um, how energy changes over time uh, in the form of heat, sound, radiation and vibration. They also um, can function at a biomolecular level, uh, very, very relevant in terms of uh, detecting the signatures of infectious disease, including COVID-19. We'll come back to that. And look, the list goes on, but the point of, of course is that these sensors um, uh, interface with the digital world that we are all living uh, with and um, We'll talk briefly to some of these concepts of sensor fusion, and we're all familiar with the idea that sensors are part of uh, the Internet of Things. Um, but at the end of the day, sensors are about improving performance, uh, informing better decisions, and uh, improving our lives. Um, and I'll try to explain and expand on those concepts now. Smart sensors are, is actually a concept that's been around for a while. If you Google smart sensor, you might see definition uh, in terms of IEEE that says um, what's flowing on the slide here. Let me not replay the text, but look, the idea of a smart sensor is very much a sensor that's connected onto the uh, internet. Um, we often think about smart homes uh, where sensors are embedded into the infrastructure um, and we're all familiar with sensors in the terms of wearables. I wear a Fitbit. Um, our smartphones incorporate sensors. Um, we talk about smart farms and smart cities. And obviously, uh, e-health uh, has emerged uh, in the last 18 months. And all of these sensors are connected to the Internet of Things, as I said. And there's a lot of big data that um, is uh, going on in the background. Um, one of the important concepts that emerges as we think about sensors is the notion of sensor fusion, which I'll come back to. Now, sensor fusion sounds like a pretty abstract um, concept, but basically sensor fusion is the idea that I can form a more complete and comprehensive picture when I combine different sensors. Um, the human uh, being is, in fact, a great example of sensor fusion, the way uh, our brain um, works. We see, we hear, um, and that um, combination of hearing and seeing is a really brilliant example of sensor fusion. Um, and to explain and expand, simply think about when you're driving along the road, you can see something. And when the um, vision impairment, maybe it's raining, it turns out your, ears, your, your ears pick up and that uh, allows you to, to maintain that picture. That's sensor fusion. So sensor fusion is uh, an emerging concept that allows us to uh, create a more complete picture of a situation. It's also a big business. Um, what we've seen over the last decade uh, and over the last couple of years in particular is that uh, sensing is really big business. There's a lot of investment. There's a lot of growth in industry. Um, it's a huge part of our ecosystem. It happens to be an area that 
Uh, Sydney, New South Wales um, has a critical mass, both in the university sector, but also uh, within uh, high tech industry. Um, and of course, it's been driven by the ubiquitousness of uh, smart devices, but also an appreciation of the importance that smart sensors can play in addressing some of the really important problems we face. And I'll come back to that. So as Alice mentioned, I'm co-director of the New South Wales Smart Sensory Network. Um, this is a state government supported initiative. Um, I don't want to belabor the slide, except that it says that uh, we are connected to the universities, as you would expect. Um, and more importantly, uh, we're connected into the defense slash industry end user ecosystem uh, working with government agencies, working with uh, Sydney Water, um, other uh, national state based uh, corporations and defense uh, industry uh, as well, as well as SME. So there's a really a vibrant ecosystem um, that we sit within and that we are connecting. So what I'd like to do is spend five minutes just taking you through some case studies. Maybe this sets the scene for the conversation. Um, I think it's worth starting off with a slide that says, in fact, when we started the New South Wales Smart Sensing Network five years ago, uh, it was in the context of a number of really important issues that the New South Wales government was facing as it relates to air pollution, um, in particular around the Hunter Valley Rail Corridor, I'll come back to that, whether it's around uh, contaminated water, uh, particularly the issues uh, around PFAS, PFAS contamination up around Williamstown, but even as it relates to um, tracking wildlife and uh, a problem that's sort of ongoing, which is koala uh, habitats around uh, highways. But there are other issues, changing security, aging population, chronic disease, infectious disease, and data explosion. So let's look briefly at air quality. Well, I mean, interestingly enough, in Sydney, we look outside and it's usually beautiful blue sky. But in fact, we know that even in Sydney, the air pollution has significant impact on our health. Uh, globally, we know that um, there are millions of lives lost every year, that it reduces life expectancy, that has a massive impact on the global economy, particularly in areas um, where there are developing economies, where the impact and consequence is dramatic. Um, even in Sydney, uh, it's been costed out at about $10 billion per annum. This is a number that's a few years old, so I'm going to round it up. Um, and we actually know that um, it's significant enough that the state government, the health department takes this seriously. I'm not stated on this slide. It's, we know that on average, for someone living in the city of Sydney, air pollution is probably taking a couple of months off your lifespan on average. So it's worth taking seriously. And that obviously uh, is for a healthy person that depends on your underlying health condition. It's a more complicated situation around transport corridors. Um, and so one of the foci of the New South Wales Smart Sensing Network has been on uh, deploying uh, sensor networks around uh, rail corridors. I can see Dr. Tom Honori, who has joined, is a member of my team at the University of Sydney and has worked with the New South Wales Department on deploying smart sensors around uh, rail corridors. And um, in that case, you know, it's a complicated business because um, the air that we breathe is, if you like, contaminated with a number of um, particles that um, on the one hand appear naturally, so sea salt, sand, um, but really what uh, we're focused on in that particular study is coal dust uh, associated with the so-called coal rail corridor and of course, diesel and other emissions that uh, can have significant impact on cardiovascular health. It's more complicated than just particles. It turns out there are gases that uh, also need to be sensed. Uh, and we can have a conversation about how um, different sensors are designed for different uh, functions. And there's a trade-off in terms of cost, uh, complexity and accuracy. Um, and what we're doing at City Nano, it's worth mentioning, is try to bring some of these sensors onto a chip to uh, allow us it in the long term, possibly to integrate these sensors into your smartphone. I'll come back to that point. 
Uh, here's Tom, um, and this is a, a, an image uh, from a few years ago, just to exemplify what um, an air quality sensor might look like. These are sensors that have been developed uh, as part of a research project sponsored by the state government, um, specifically around their transport corridor. And these are some of the tests that have been done in clean room environments. Um, look, without belaboring the point, um, it's worth saying that sensors like this are available commercially, you get what you pay for, um, and they vary in cost and performance over many orders of magnitude. And we can come back to that as part of the panel discussion. Um, second, uh, let me move on. I know I don't have a lot of time, Alice, to talk a little bit about some of the thinking that went into uh, sensors in uh, the context of COVID-19. It wouldn't surprise you if I said that Sydney Nano as a flagship institute for the University of Sydney early in 2020 started a working group looking at how sensors might um, help address some of the challenges we were facing early on. We weren't even sure if we could detect the signatures of infectious disease, um, but of course that's become ubiquitous. The narrative evolved and became um, more around how do we protect uh, high risk sites? How do we detect signatures of infection so that we can actually empower someone to know they need to be tested? Um, we had a wonderful collaborative effort across a number of faculties at the university, um, engaging with clinicians and even patients led by Alison Tong, a fantastic professor in the School of Public Health and that got published uh, early this year in the journal Nature Biotechnology. It's worth noting that's a very prestigious journal. So being published in Nature Biotechnology is itself quite an achievement. You can actually download this paper. It's available and it sets out a bit of a roadmap for how sensors can be used in the home as part of a wearable, possibly as a remote sensor, possibly to protect a high risk facility and to help society return to normal um, so I think it's fair to say this uh, publication has had some real impact on some of the thinking around um, that transition back to um, normal life. One of the uh, case studies there is around public screening of large populations. So we know when we go for a drink at the Shangri-La Hotel, as I have a few times recently, where you walk into the lobby and you stop by some fellow who wants to test uh, your temperature, and we know that those measurements are not particularly reliable. Um, and there are real challenges with doing that, um, particularly around some of the high risk facilities. So um, we've, uh, and we are looking at, um, can we use sensor fusion, as I alluded to earlier, machine learning, it turns out that maybe you can infer um, aspects of someone's um, health condition from, um, some smart computer vision that tells you more than just the temperature. So uh, there's a lot of exciting research that's gonna play into this um, uh, area. The sense of fusion narrative uh, does come up again. Um, and just to remind you, the idea here is that you can combine different sensors. So this might be a wearable, it might be a temperature measurement, it might be a remote sensing device that detects some uh, physiological parameter and these sensors might, together with some very smart data analytics and AI machine learning, tell you that you really need to go and get tested, tell you that you shouldn't go to work. Uh, that would just be transformative for our world. Uh, as I know, we go into the flu season and how many of us are sort of not really sure if we sick, are we not sick? Do we need to get tested? Uh, how many of us are going to get tested? So that was an interesting narrative. Um, so look, just to wrap up a little bit of a perspective on sensors um, in real world, uh, at the University of Sydney, we have a very exciting partnership with the Royal Australian Air Force. This was announced about two years ago. Um, it's fair to say uh, this research isn't really in the public domain. Um, it's not classified, but it's certainly um, under the wraps for now. But uh, the general narrative is to provide the Air Force with situational awareness, which is about allowing them to understand um, their situation using smart sensors. So many of the ideas that I've already alluded to are being used by defense to provide uh, safeguarding for us. So um, this is uh, taken a year and a half ago when we hosted Air Commodore Darren Goldie um, and Jerome Greed 
uh, in the City Nano Science Hub. So last uh, few slides, um, I'll refer to some of Tom's work again on using uh, sensors to actually detect whales. So this is a great example of sensor technology that has multiple purposes. So um, the same sensor technology that I alluded to for protecting high-risk facilities from infectious disease can be repurposed for looking for signatures of whales. Um, and literally here, the idea is that you can see the infrared signature of the whales spurting out the water. Um, turns out this is really useful um, in the um, seismic uh, wave sort of industry, oil rig industry, they're worried about um, interference from whales. So this is a big business um, and we can come back to this. The last example is to talk to the bushfires. In 2020, we uh, had a virtual symposium that focused on uh, sensors and bushfires. And what emerges there is a really interesting narrative that says, look, right now, it's fair to say they're not really using the state of the art uh, sensor technology. Um, but the vision really going forward is this bold idea that in the future, a sensor will detect the signature of a fire almost within the nanosecond so that it can be put out by drones uh, before the fire can kind of get out of control. And so there does need to be a sensor fusion perspective um, using aerial sensors, satellite remote sensors, UAVs, uh, atmospheric sensors, and to bring that kind of data AI perspective so that literally the fire is put out before it's almost started. So what a fantastic vision. Um, and it's all about sensors. So I'll wrap up, Alice. Um, if anyone's interested in anything I've said, I mean, we'll have a conversation, but feel free to reach out to me by email or follow us on Twitter or go to our website and I'm happy to stay around for the conversation, Alice. Thanks very much. Thanks so much, Ben. I know there's so much to share and it's really tricky to fit into a short talk. Um, thanks for that fabulous overview of some of the work that, that you're leading and that the New South Wales Smart Sensing Network is part of. Um, I'm sure folks will have lots of questions for Ben. You can start to store them up in the chat. Um, and we've heard you know, um, a perspective here that's very much um, from the sensor enabling and the sensor science, what sensors can do for science. Um, and if I ask Ben to just stop sharing his slides for a moment, um, I'll ask our next speaker to upload her slides. So Yela, if you don't mind doing that while I give you a brief introduction, that would be fabulous. So now we're gonna hear uh, a little bit more from the citizen science perspective. Um, one of the things that, that we've discussed in the citizen science community quite, quite a little bit, um, and I'm sure many of you um, have been part of those discussions, is that one of the things we need to do is actually um, increase the numbers of, uh, of conversations between citizen scientists, citizen science practitioners, and researchers in the universities who aren't yet involved in citizen science projects. So hopefully that's something that's going to come out in the discussion too. Okay, so Yela slides are ready, so I'll introduce Dr. Yela Golumbic. I'm absolutely delighted that Yela can be part of this seminar today. Um, she is a researcher with vast experience in science communication research, and she's particularly um, interested in citizen science and engaging the public. Uh, Yela has experience in the design and implementation of numerous citizen science projects and she's got some fans in the room with her so um, we're all presenting from home so um, just to let you know that some fans might pop in from now and again. Um, Yela um, has been part of two projects that she designed and managed um, back in Israel which are particularly pertinent to tonight's discussion because they relate to sensor technology. They're the Sensing the Air project and the Radon Home Survey and I will let Yela tell you more about both of these projects um, with support from her, her, from other members of her family. Um, thanks, um, Yela. Please take it away. Thank you so much, Alison. Hopefully, there won't be uh, too many interruptions uh, today. Um, and I'm really happy to be speaking here. And I've had the privilege to work with Alice over the past year and a half. But today, I'm actually going to be 
uh, presenting, as Alice said, uh, some of the work that I did prior to my arrival at Sydney University. Uh, and this is work that I've conducted um, in Israel. In the, and so in Israel, I was leading the project called Sensing the Air. Uh, which is a citizen science project for monitoring air quality in the local environment. So Ben gave a perfect introduction discussing all the different sensors um, and the different uh, air pollutants that can be uh, monitored using sensors. And we did use uh, various different kinds of sensors. Uh, and as sensors developed over time, um, we tried to introduce new sensors and also examine their reliability uh, in the context of citizen science. Uh, but to give you a little bit of background about sensing the air and specifically about the location where this project was initiated, uh, which was the city of Haifa. And it's a city in Israel, which uh, has the biggest industrial area in the country. Uh, these are facilities which are placed in physical proximity to concentrations of populations. Um, and for many years, people have been worried about the air pollution in the city. And there have been ongoing pro protests trying to reduce uh, these facilities uh, and to close them down with lots of protests uh, on the streets. But this has actually been going on for many years. So you can see in this picture, there's a little girl, uh, that's me 25 years ago demonstrating with a sign that says, help me, I am suffocating. But when this particular study started around 2015, uh, there was an um, extra uh, public uh, debate that arose because recent um, um, research has been coming out specifically looking at Haifa as a possible uh, pollution striking zone and research about different uh, cancer uh, cases uh, emerging in this area in higher numbers than the rest of the country. And so this was a really good time and provided a really good setting to start monitor the air quality uh, and to engage citizens in part of this practice. And so what I want to discuss today um, is the project design over time, how we started with the project, how it evolved with time, how the complexity of the different things that we have done and the levels of engagement of the public increased over time as the project was established and as we learned um, who the different people that were engaging were and what their needs were from a project like this. And so I'm gonna start from the very beginning. Uh, the first thing that we did was engaging school students in the project. And I'll describe a little bit of the research that we did together with school students. Um, then we transferred to the general public, uh, installing sensors in people's homes. We built a platform for people to visualize the data. Um, and then we transitioned into more personal sensing. So people could actually do their own research using the sensors uh, and join different campaigns uh, that we had uh, regarding monitoring of air quality. And in the end, I will sort of summarize everything uh, by some research, research that we did, identifying the different engagement styles of the people that participated in sensing the air. And so, as I said, the first thing that we did was engaging school students and we met with with teachers and with students and we uh, demonstrated uh, the different ideas of air qualities and experiments in the class and together with the students and with the teachers, we um, built a series of different experiments that we wanted to examine with these um, monitors. So you can see uh, the teacher here in the picture in the left is holding a sensor. It is a rather large sensor. Um, it was state of the art at the time. Uh, today, these sensors have developed and even over the course of the project and become smaller. <laughs> uh, but those were the sensors that we were using initially. And so these are a few examples for projects that um, students had um, and, and teachers had came up together. So this is an example for an experiment comparing or monitoring uh, more like uh, indoor air quality in different locations within the school. So you can see in the picture on the left, there's a lab, then just a regular classroom a specialized classroom, where it's a small classroom that, that usually takes um, just a few students to teach them, and then uh, the teacher's room. So this was one uh, 
design. Uh, we also uh, had slightly different sensors, which we put in the same room, in this, but in different levels of a building, also in the schools. And finally, we looked at the difference between um, one side of the school that was uh, on the street and the other side of the street that was in the, in the garden and looking at the uh, differences and, and the influence of transportation on the air quality. And so all this information um, was, gener was automatically collected in a database that researchers had access to. And researchers used this information to understand, uh, to better understand the air quality over you know, these different um, uh, dimensions, but also just over time and space. Um, and so this is an example for one of the results that we've got. Uh, in the picture above, you can see the four schools that we uh, put these, uh, ins installed these sensors in. Uh, the above picture is on the street side. Uh, the picture below is in the yard side, looking at the differences between air quality uh, and uh, close to the street uh, where the transportation was and the, um, the garden. So we can really see here some uh, very dramatic differences. We also did a little bit of research within the schools to examine what students have been learning. And so in this graph over here, you can see the knowledge of students about air quality um, before and after they participated in this project. Uh, you can see uh, on the right uh, column over here, the increased knowledge about air quality after they have participated, um, while the control group uh, showed no differences uh, from before and after. So we also, by engaging students, by them conducting this research, um, their knowledge uh, or their learning outcomes are really benefited. So the next stage was taking these uh, to people's houses. And we did it in the beginning actually with school students. We invited school students to take a sensor to their house and to involve their families in this research. And we uh, installed these same sensors in people's houses. These are a few examples of different locations uh, where we uh, installed these sensors. They were uh, on the windowsills and balconies, gardens, wherever people had room to put a sensor like this. But we also wanted a way for people to really clearly see the information that was collected, because as you saw from the graphs above, they were quite complex. Uh, and also we had to generate these graphs for the school students at the time in order for them to have access to the data because the big database was just too complicated to share uh, and to really understand. And so the next thing we did is that we built a user's um, platform. Uh, and we did this using a user-centered design approach, meaning that we um, went to the people that were our participants and we involved them in the process of the design. And through an iterative process of you know, going back and forth, we designed this platform, which you can see the picture of uh, in the end, which has different levels of information. So you can see uh, the map, the spatula level, where you can see just generally the whole city with different uh, the census locations with a, a color scale from green to red. But you can also see a little bit more detailed information on the right. You can see uh, the different uh, pollutants that were uh, examined in each station. So this is, for example, NO2, CO, um, and ozone. And then we could also see a graph looking at the distribution of the pollutants over time. And there, every person that, that um, participated or was looking for information could look at it at the level that was relevant to them and interesting for them. And we also did a little bit of research on this just to see if this was actually understandable, if after we did all this process of going back and forth to participants, we were able to come up with a design that was useful for them. And so we took a snapshot of the different uh, images and we asked them, what can you tell us? Uh, what can you understand from this uh, map? And so what we learned is that overall, there was 70% uh, understanding or 70% of uh, uh, average score on the different questions, meaning the mostly understood the different visualizations. But it was really interesting to see that as people had a higher scientific education, their scores were also higher, which we can understand that it makes sense that people that have a higher scientific education understand these science, science data better. 
But when we divided this to the different people that participated, to authentic users who were people who actually were using this platform on a daily basis, relative to people who were just answering the survey or sort of seeing this data for the first time, we actually saw that there were no differences between the different groups. So showing that when we really um, put in the effort to design this kind of system using people's uh, uh, feedback, we were able to, to um, make a, a platform that was understandable to everyone, making the scientific data truly accessible and usable for all the people that used it. And so I'm going to quickly run through a few of the next steps that we did. Uh, after we did this, and you saw that we installed these uh, uh, sensors for a long period of time in people's houses, we also wanted to let people uh, do their own kinds of experiments, not only looking over time, but also doing other kinds of things. And at this point, we already had these smaller sensors um, that we were able to, people were able to take with them from place to place. Um, so we offered these to participants to basically uh, create their own research. Uh, and we asked them to think about a research question, a research design, so that we're actually doing the whole, um, all the different steps of uh, conducting research. And this is an example for one of the research uh, um, designs and results of one of the participants. So they were examining the air quality in the different rooms with open windows and with closed windows. So I'll just walk you through it. So they started um, uh, in room one. So the, here we're just looking at the different pollutants. We're looking at the NO, um, O3, which is ozone, and NO2. Um, so we're looking here particularly at the NO2, which we see that is the one that changed the most. Um, levels here were a little bit high in room one with the closed window, but when the, with the open window levels reduced a little bit when they were transferred to room number two, it was actually reduced um, much more, I mean, showing the different air quality, but just between two rooms and one uh, um, a house. But interestingly, when they opened the window in room two, the air quali quality uh, or the air pollution went back up, uh, showing that there was actually something outside that by opening the window, the air pollution came into the house. Um, and then again, when they transferred it to room uh, number three and closed the window, uh, the levels of the air pollution um, averaged back. So this is just an example to allow people to decide what to do in their lives, uh, to open windows, to close windows, which room is the safest room, uh, which room uh, in, in the case of uh, room number one, this is the room where their baby was sleeping. So they were quite happy that the um, uh, levels uh, were um, uh, um, we're, we're not quite as bad as, uh, as in room three, uh, but this is just a few examples of how people use these sensors and the information that they got from it. I'm going to rush through, this was just a, a report that participants uh, uh, wrote about what they're doing, but really just to share this information with the rest of the community. We put that as a blog on our website and on social media to share this different knowledge and these different uh, uh, designs of research that people could do with the rest of the community. Um, one more thing that we, done, what we did were different campaigns. And these were really interesting. This was a particular case of, of uh, a big fire that happened in Haifa, uh, where a lot of people actually lost their houses and a lot of the houses were severely damaged. And after people were already allowed back to the house, some um, people came to, uh, to the project and said, we're allowed to come back to the house, but look at the house, it's all black. Are we, is it safe to go back to the house? Is it safe uh, to go back and live here? Um, and so we collected a few uh, additional sensors, things that weren't necessarily um, a part of the project, but that different air quality researchers at the university had uh, uh, lent us. And we were able to actually um, uh, do this research and show uh, that indeed the levels of black carbon, which is what um, you see here in black in the picture, were elevated in the rooms relative to the black to the background measurements. Uh, but these levels were still under 
the standard. So therefore we were able to tell people that it is still under the standard and therefore safe to go uh, to live in the houses, but also with giving recommendations and how to lower uh, still these concentrations uh, of the black carbon in their houses. Um, uh, just very briefly bringing all of this together, we wanted to see uh, who the different peoples that were participating and really look over time and to understand what their different needs were because that's really what um, got the project going all the time and uh, brought all the different innovations into the project. And so by looking over time at the different people that participated, we were able to classify them into five different groups. So firstly, they were the worried, worried residents that were you know, people that lived in the area, heard about the air pollution problem and were worried about themselves and about their families. For example, I feel this is my responsibility as a parent. I don't want to take the chance that my children will become sick. Next, we have the education and outreach motivation. These were often teachers uh, that wanted to raise awareness to the topics of air quality using something that was relevant for students and for um, uh, their uh, content and context. Uh, for example, this topic concerns us in Haifa area. It's something the students are aware of. It's authentic and relevant to them. We had the environmental action. Uh, these were people that were already usually very active in environmental uh, um, activities, uh, protesting against the facilities that I showed you in the pictures. For example, we are a growing group of activists contesting industry development programs that the government wants to introduce. Then we had the people that were generally really interested in air quality. They wanted to do more sophisticated research. They wanted to examine lots of different things and really understand uh, the air quality uh, research and its applications. For example, what I really wanna do is to examine air quality at home and compare it to different locations. If I had 20 sensors, I would be able to do this. Lastly, we have the opportunistics. There's people that stumbled across the, across the project at a specific time of need. For example, the people that uh, contacted us in regard to that fire that we saw, but there were a number of different campaigns that we ran. Uh, for example, I would love to participate in your upcoming campaign. Um, so these are examples for different people who all participated in one project, but they come from completely different directions, completely different motivations, and therefore their satisf satisfaction and their experience were completely different experiences. And so I wanted to demonstrate with this how, you know, there's so many different opportunities to engage people with science and with these sensors to do science. Um, and I think opening up uh, the projects and um, applying a flexible design, a flexible, flexible design uh, that enables different people to do different kinds of things that are interesting for them and relevant for them. Uh, I think that's really the key uh, to successful citizen science projects. At, at the end of the day, this is what we want. We wanna create more engagement, uh, better science uh, and relevant science uh, for people. Um, so I'm really looking forward to the conversation uh, and the discussion coming next. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Alice, for inviting me to speak today. Thank you so much, Yela. Um, it was wonderful to hear from you. So what we're going to do for the next 15 minutes um, is to have a discussion with Ben and Yela. And we're going to continue recording this session until 6 p.m. Um, it might continue recording after six, but we won't share anything once I say. We're not going to share anything from the recording when we post publicly. Um, so I would welcome anybody who would like to ask a question directly and is comfortable with being on film or on camera to, to do so. Um, otherwise, I will uh, read some of your questions from the chat. But um, I also have a couple of questions for Yela and Ben just to start us off. So please let me know by either raising your hand or switching your camera on. Um, Michelle's also going to kindly help me with this. Um, Michelle Neal is from the Australian Citizen Science Association too. So thanks, Michelle, um, for keeping an eye out for folks. Um, but I think I'd just like to start, um, Yela, I'll perhaps start with you. Um, you know, 
Ben showed us a range of different sensors and, and some of the sensors that, uh, that Ben and his team will use in the lab, I would dare say are probably a little bit too expensive um, for citizen science, scientists to use. How do you um, get the right balance in picking sensors that give enough um, data and data that is usable and reliable within the context of a study and balance that with the sophistication of sensors that might be available to research facilities with, with a lot of funding? Yeah, thank you, Alice. That's a really good question. And that's something that we struggled with a lot during the project because we do want to make um, these sensors available for everyone. And spe specifically, our project um, bought all these sensors and gave them to people for a limited amount of time so they could use. So those sensors that we saw in the beginning uh, were a little bit more expensive. They were on the range of probably $1,000 per sensor. Um, so it's a little bit more on the expensive side uh, of the sensors. As the sensors uh, or as the project um, continued, we did want to make those sensors much, much cheaper so we could get more sensors, get more engagement for people. Um, and so you have, there's, there is a balance. So you either decide you're only going to look at one pollutant. You're not going to look at various many pollutants uh, because as you add more and more pollutants that you want to monitor, the prices go up. Uh, but another thing that we've also done um, is to calibrate the sensors, not in an um, objective kind of way necessarily, like you would do in a high level sophisticated lab, but calibrate them one to the other. So they're calibrated one to the other. And then even though maybe if, um, for example, they're monitoring, they're saying it's like 50 ppm, which is uh, um, the level of, uh, of a, a specific pollutant, it may not actually be 50 according to objective, uh, um, uh, monitoring uh, or the very sophisticated ones, but since they are calibrated to one another, so the differences are the same differences. And therefore mm -hmm. we normalized all of those data based on one calibration and then just uh, uh, calibrated one to another. And then we were able to utilize even those sensors that weren't very, very high quality, but they did give a very, very high accuracy when calibrated one to each other. Thanks, Shayla. Um, I might come to Ben next. Um, so Ben, in addition to, you know, issues with the cost of sensors and trying to spread them amongst the community, what might you perceive as from the sort of the more scientist perspective as some of the challenges or issues that there might be with trying to engage the public in the use of sensors um, in citizen science? Yeah, good question. Um... So let me think about how to answer that. Uh, there are all sorts of issues. I mean, sensors accuracy, sensors that need to be calibrated, sensors that provide information that is useful. Um, I mean, one of the concerns that we always sort of consider is that do people really benefit from having the information that sensors provide and how does that help them in their daily lives? Um, so there's a trade-off between, on the one hand, empowering people, um, which is the narrative I like. You know, I often talk about, we talk about the Google Maps, you know, Google Maps already gives you information that tells you about traffic. What we'd love to see on Google Maps is information about air quality and pollutants and um, humidity and all sorts of things. Um, but you can overload and overwhelm people and you can actually impact mental health and you can become a burden on society if you provide too much information. Um, and then there's the accuracy and the reliability of the information. And um, so that might be an initial uh, thought bubble. So we've done some work and again, Tom Anori is here, can back me up if I'm out of um, um, my area of expertise on this specific topic. We've done some work with um, various stakeholders on building what we call heterogeneous sensor networks. And that is the idea that you might actually uh, combine, it's a bit like the sensor fusion narrative, citizen science sensors with sensors that are administered by the state <laughs> to create a resilient network that's based on heterogeneous sensors. So then you have, on the one hand, sensors in the hands of individuals, but you also have kind of some 
calibration and some averaging there with the sensors that are already sitting with the department and so forth. So that's an initial perspective, Alice. I mean, that can go in different directions, that conversation, I think. Yeah, of course, I might. Um, um, and of course, feel free to, Yela and Ben, to, to jump off on each other. But maybe I'll come to Yela with a specific piece of what Ben was just talking about. So in terms of your projects, how do you deal with that responsibility? So if you have citizen scientists who are collecting data and learning things about their environment and um, who are empowered to know more about them, what responsibility, ethical responsibility, do you have as a researcher to then support them if they find out news about pollution that isn't the greatest of news? Yeah, so I think that's really important. It really is important to support people throughout, not just with the data. There are a lot of things that people could do in this case in order to um, protect themselves from air quality. If it's you know closing the windows on days where the pollution is really bad and turning the air conditioning on. The air conditioning is actually a really good filter of air as well. So when we turn on the air conditioning, we're actually filtering the air in the house and improving the air quality um, in the house. Um, so that is one thing uh, that we uh, can recommend. And we did, we, uh, one of the things that we added on the platform was recommendations, uh, health recommendations to close the window, or for example, not to go outside for physical activity on days where the air pollution uh, is quite bad. Um, so those are kinds of things and recommendations that we um, could give and have given on a regular basis to people in order for them to protect um, their, own, their own lives and environments. Thanks, Sheila. So um, I will come to some questions in the chat in a moment because I want to invite people to ask them themselves if they want to. And I'm going to give them a moment to do that once I've uh, switched off the video in case anyone's feeling shy because some folks would prefer not to, to ask while they're being recorded. Um, but I might come to just one more question before I do um, stop recording and, and open the floor to, to folks who are here. Um, and that was, I want to link back then to this idea of the internet of things that you uh, brought up in your talk. So on the one hand, Yela has led a project where you've distributed sensors to people and asked them to, to make these measurements. But some of us, um, some of us might have even rushed to buy air filters um, after bushfires or air conditioning systems. And some of these um, devices have inbuilt sensors. They have, they give us feedback on the air quality of our rooms, for example. To what extent do you think we could um, collaborate with some of the manufacturers of these products? And perhaps rather than having to have sensors distributed to folks, use the data or create ethics applications to use data from these products to sort of build a network or measurements of air quality. Has anybody done this work then either from a non-citizen science perspective or Yale from a citizen science perspective? And what, what do you envisage could be some issues or some advantages of this? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know what the answer to that is. Maybe Yale's gonna have a better perspective. Um, what's the issue there? I mean, your so the issue there is you're saying the sensors are built into these products already. Why are they not sharing that information? Why are they not yeah. making it? Well, because they don't have to, because they're not being asked to. It's their information. And, and if they are sharing that information, there are probably then obligations on them. So, but yeah, I mean, been, you'd have to have ethics approval to yeah. let people know that that data would be shared. Um, but I, I just feel like folks might be happy, you know, if it was uh, anonymized in some way to share that information. And it's maybe a source that we're not tapping, for example. I think you're right. I think it is a source we're not tapping. If it is indeed the case that there are sensors built into these other products. Um, but there are certainly sensors that you can buy that it would put in your lounge room that will then connect to the cloud and that will share information with the rest of the world. So you can go onto a map and you can see what the air quality is in Camperdown. Um, and that's based on a number of citizen science sensors that are connected to the cloud. That's a pretty well established. It isn't as ubiquitous as it needs to be. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. Ben. And, and I yeah. think the issue is, so yeah, definitely everybody has sensors today and um, 
connecting all of those together would create, you know, large databases that were really interesting. Uh, but I think even one of the things that we struggled with in the project was even looking at standard data. So air quality is monitored worldwide by official stations. And at the time when we started this uh, project, while the information was technically um, available or on the internet, it was so difficult to find. I mean, even I, multiple times, like it took me like, I don't know, maybe 15 minutes every time to just find the site where the information was uh, presented. And even then it was not presented in a way that anyone can understand. It was, you know, um, tables and tables of, you know, so many different uh, pollutants and information and data every half an hour uh, of measurements. It's not something that people can grasp. So just mm -hmm. taking even that information that is standardized information done by municipalities and governments and putting that into an app, like in the platform that we built, uh, was something that would really uh, empower people. And today it's sort of standard, but at the time when we did that, that information was really not accessible to people. Thanks, Shayla. Thanks, Ben. Um, I'm going to stop the recording now, but we'll continue to open up the discussion. So just for folks who are watching this recording, it feels weird to be doing this in the past, which is now your present, and maybe people are going to watch it in their future. But thank you for watching today's um, series, um, this today's um, uh, conference uh, presentation from uh, ben and Yela. I'd like to thank Dr. Yela Glumbick and Professor Benjamin Eggleton, and to thank the Office of the Chief South Scientist, New South Wales for sponsoring, and of course, the Australian Citizen Science Association. So thank you.